chair was trying to stop me. I don't know why. when you give a reading basically you wish that nobody was there <laughs> so will you please leave <laughs> this poem is about boy in St. Lucia and being around the docks, the wharves, where there are some huge men working. And some of them would deteriorate very rapidly through alcohol, or very often to the most common disease, diabetes, that has to do with alcohol. So you would see some of these big men, and they would shrink for your eyes after a while. They were beautiful looking men because, because of their bulk. This was my early war. The bellowing quarrels at the pitch of noon of men moving cargoes while gulls screeched their monotonous vowels in complex curses without coming to blows. Muscular men, swirling codfish barrels and heaving rice bags, who had stunted the nicknames, who could one-handed hoist phenomenal rolls of wire, hoist flapping galvanized with both arms to pitch it into the hold while hooks and winches swung nearby. At lunch, they ate in the shade of mountainous freight bound with knots and cinches, ignoring the gulls with their boulders of bread. Then one would be terribly injured, one lose a leg to rum and diabetes. You would watch him shrink into his nickname, not too proud to beg, who would roar like a lorry revving in the prime of his drink. White egret. Cautious of time's light, and how often it will allow the morning shadows to lengthen across the lawn, the stalking egrets to wriggle their beaks and swallow when you, not they, or you and they are gone. For clattering parrots to launch their fleet at sunrise, for April to ignite the African violet in the drumming world that dampens your tired eyes behind the two clouding lenses, sunrise, sunset, the quiet ravages of diabetes. Accept it all with level sentences, the sculpted settlement that sets each stanza. Learn how the bright lawn puts up no defenses against the egret's stabbing question and the night's answer. The elegance of those white orange-billed egrets, each like a stalking ear, the thick olive trees, cedars consoling a stream that roars torrentially in the wet season into that peace beyond desires and beyond regrets at which I may arrive eventually, whose palms droop in the sun like palanquins with tigerish shadows under them. They shall be there after my shadow passes with all its sins into a green thicket of oblivion with the rising and setting of a hundred suns over Santa Cruz Valley where I loved in vain. I watch the huge trees tossing at the edge of the lawn like a heaving sea without crests. The bamboos plunge their necks like roped horses as yellow leaves torn from the whipping branches turn to an avalanche. 
All this before the rain scarily pours from the burst sudden canvas of the sky like a hopeless sail, dusting sheets and hazing the hills completely, as if the whole valley were a hill out riding the gale and the woods were not trees but waves of a running sea. When light cracks and thunder groans as if cursed, and you are safe in a dark house deep in Santa Cruz with the lights out, the current suddenly gone, you think, fool house, the shivering hawk, and the impeccable egret, and the cloud-colored heron, and the parrots who panic at the false fire of dawn. These birds keep modeling for Audubon, the snowy egret or white heron in a book that in my youth would open like a lawn in Emerald Santa Cruz, knowing how well they look, strutting perfection. They speckle the islands on a river bank in mangrove marsh or cattle pasture, gliding over ponds and balancing on the ridge of a silken heifer or fleeing disaster in hurricane weather and picking ticks with their electric scab as if it were sheer privilege to study them in their mythical conceit that they have beat across the sea from Egypt to the pharaonic ibis, its orange beak and feet, profiled and quiet to adorn a crypt, then launch themselves with wings that, beating faster, are certain as a seraph's when they beat. The perpetual ideal is astonishment. The cool green lawn, the quiet trees, the forest and the hill there, then the white gasp of an egret, sent sailing into the frame, then teetering to rest with its gawky stride, erect an egret emblem. Another thought surprises, a hawk on the wrist of a branch, soundlessly, like a falcon, shoots into heaven, circling above praise or blame, with the same high indifference of yours, now dropping to tear a field mouse with its claws. The page of the lawn and this open page are the same. An egret astonishes the page. The high hawk calls over a dead thing, a love that was pure punishment. I hadn't seen them for half of the Christmas week, the egrets, and no one told me why they had gone. But they are back with the rain now, orange beak, pink shanks, and stabbing head back on the lawn where they used to be in the clear, limitless rain of the Santa Cruz Valley, which, when it rains, falls steadily against the cedars till it mists the plain. The egrets are the color of waterfalls and of clouds. Some friends, the few I have left, are dying, <coughs> but the egrets stalk through the rain as if nothing mortal can affect them, or they lift like abrupt angels, say, then settle again. Sometimes the hills themselves disappear like friends, slowly. But I am happier that they have come back now, like memory, like prayer. With the leisure of a leaf falling in the forest, pale yellow spinning against green, my ending. Soon it will be the dry season. The hills will rust. The egrets dip their ne necks undulant bending, stabbing at worms and grubs after the rain. Sometimes, erect as bowling pins, they stand as strips of cotton wool peel from the mountain. Then, when they move gawkily, they move this hand with their feet, flayed fingers, their darting necks. You share one instinct, that ravenous feeding, my pen's beak plucking up, wriggling insects like nouns and gulping them. <coughs> the nib reading as it writes, shaking off angrily what its beak rejects. <coughs> Selection is what the egrets teach on the wide open lawn, heads nodding as they read in purposeful silence, a language beyond speech. 